my slide for me? Let's pray. Father, God, we just thank you so much for your love for us. As the psalm says, we love you, Lord, because you first loved us. Even when we were sinners, even when we were your enemies, you loved us. And your love is something we can't fully understand. But we thank you for what understanding we have of it so far. And Father, as we continue to go through your word, we ask for continued understanding, for revelation. And we thank you for it, in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 You know, as we travel, not just in different churches, but different countries, we notice as we talk to people, whether it's in Asia or in America, that even Christians sometimes have a misunderstanding of God, the Father. In fact, one of my friends, but he was not a Christian, so that's understandable, he looked at the God of the Old Testament as cruel and harsh, and Jesus as a good guy. And sometimes even Christians can have that idea that the father is the bad cop and Jesus is the good cop. The father is the one with a hammer and Jesus is the one who comes and says, give them a break. <laughs> but as we know, God is not divided. Amen? The Trinity, the Father, Son, and Spirit are one. And there is no division. And the heart of the Father is the heart of Jesus, is the heart of the Spirit. Jesus said, if you have seen me, Philip, you've seen the Father. He says, I do nothing but accept what the Father shows me and tells me to do. The Trinity is united, not divided. But really, as you think about it, there is a false idea in the world, and maybe among some Christians, that the Father is harsh, while Jesus is the, is the, is the one that you go to for help. And I want to say today, that is not true at all. And I want to show the heart of the Father Looking at the Old Testament, which generally is a book, or rather books, filled with times of sorrow and suffering and judgment. But I want to explain today what is truly the heart of the Father. So we want to look at, first of all, a prophet from the Old Testament. In the days before there was the covenant of grace. In the days when they lived in the covenant of law. And in the law... It was, you do good, you are blessed, you do bad, you get curses. But I want to show that even in the Old Covenant, if we look very carefully, even in the Old Testament, we will see the heart of the Father, which is not a heart of anger and bitterness, but a heart of love, a heart of grace. And even from the very beginning, God had in mind, to do good to his creation. You know in 2 Timothy 1.9, that's not up there, don't worry about it. 2 Timothy 1.9, it mentions that this grace that God has towards us was in his plan before the beginning of time. Maybe I should read that. It's such an important scripture. Those of you who have your Bibles, <laughs> 2 Timothy 1 verse 9, I didn't plan to read this, but just got prompted to. 2 Timothy 1.9. God, who has saved us and called us to a holy life, not because of anything we have done, but because of his own purpose and grace. This grace was given us in Christ Jesus before the beginning of time. I can't wrap my head around that, can you? Scientists tell us that they know that matter, time, and the world as we know it did not always exist. When God created the universe, He created time for us. God doesn't need time. Amen? God is eternal. It was the Father, Son, and Spirit, and there was nothing else. And then God decided, the Father, and the Son, and the Spirit, Let's have children, sons and daughters in our image, in our likeness, who can have a fellowship of love with us. Let's do this. And at that point, in God's mind, and as someone mentioned earlier, God declares things from the end to the beginning. God, if you conceive time as being like this platform, God is way above time because God lives beyond time. He declares the end from the beginning and he does what he pleases because he is Almighty God. 
Amen? So, before God created the universe, before He created time, He knew you by name. That's something I can't fully understand, can you? Before God created the universe, that's what it says in 2 Timothy 1 9. He knew you by name. Put your name in there. And God says, I'm going to see Burmy. I'm going to see Millet. I'm going to see Helen. My son, my daughters. And years down the road, they're going to come to know me and they will love me and they will live with me forever. Put your name in there. This is the God of whom we speak. Before time began, before the universe was created, God knew you by name. By name. Not as an idea, by name. He knew you because he is beyond time. He declares the end from the beginning. So before he created anything, God decided, I'm going to have children. I have Bernie and the left and Helen, Steve, Gloria. He knew you all by name. That's the God we're speaking of. So this idea that Adam sinned and then God said, oops, how do we fix this? It's wrong. Amen? Before God created the earth, the Father, Son, and Spirit decided we're going to have a family, sons and daughters, and we know they're going to mess up. So let's plan to fix it before we even create them. Amen? So that's where we're starting from. A God who is so powerful, so loving, before He created anything, He knew you by name, He knew all the mistakes you'd make before He created you, and He loved you even before He created you, and He had you in His mind's eye. Those of you who are parents, can you remember when your son or daughter was, were in the womb, how you planned for them and how you were excited about them, you wanted to send them to college, you had good plans for them. God was at that only much more so. In fact, it says in Psalm 139, verse 16, which I didn't plan to go to, but it's very proud of me. In Psalm 139, verse 16, it says that before a single day of our life was lived, God had listed everything okay. He wanted us to do. Okay. Can you wrap your mind around that? A God that loves us so much, before you even took a breath, God had a whole list of things He would have loved you to do. He will not force you to do them, but if you align with His best will for you, He has a plan already in heaven for you, a resume of all the things He'd like you to accomplish. That's the kind of God we're speaking of. So I wanted to set that standard. Now we can go forward. Can we go back to the slides? So we'll go from the prophet Jonah, so we have in mind that our God is all-powerful, knew us before the earth was created, before He created time. We go from the prophet Jonah down to our Lord Jesus Christ to discuss the love of God. Now the prophet Jonah, as you know, the land of Israel was divided after Solomon died because of his sins into two nations, the northern tribe, the northern tribe, we call the nation of Israel, the southern tribes were called the nation of Judah. Two separate nations, but they were all Israelites, all the people of God. Jonah was from this area, but they're all Israelites. They're all children of, this, of uh, Jacob who became known as Israel. They're all children of Israel. But after Solomon died, the land became divided into two separate nations. So the prophet Jonah was from this area. Let's read, move on to the next slide. So Jonah was called by God to go to a foreign nation. One day the Lord told Jonah, go to the city of Nineveh and say to the people, the Lord has seen your terrible sins. You are doomed. That sounds like a cartoon. Now, think of what Jonah was like. In that day and age, people only cared about their own nation. Jonah was an Israelite from the northern nation. He was a prophet of God, a servant of God, but he was an Israelite. He was very nationalistic. He did not care a hoot for the other nations. In fact, the nation of Assyria was a powerful empire. So from his perspective, they were a threat to his nation. So thinking like a nationalistic person, why should I go and help a nation that's a potential enemy of my nation? You've got to think like, like Jonah did. 
Why should I go help them? Let them do wrong. Let them be punished. Then my nation will be safe. That's Jonah's heart. But what was God's heart? Could you, could you move on? So Jonah ran from the Lord. He went to the seaport of Joppa, which is modern day Jaffa in Israel on the coast, and bought a ticket on a ship that was going to Spain. Tarshish is what we call Spain nowadays. Then he got on the ship and sailed away to escape. Now you know the rest of the story. We're not going to go through all of this. I just wanted to set the stage. He tried to escape. The Lord sent a great fish. The boat almost sank. And he confessed and said, I'm running away from God. If you throw me overboard, you will live and the ship will be safe. So the men threw him overboard. The fish swallowed him up. And the storm stopped. Then the fish, after three days and three nights inside the fish's belly, Jonah cried out to God. God heard him. The fish spat him up on the shore. Then he finally went and did what the Lord told him to do. So let's see what the Lord's word is like. So because the people of Assyria, of Nineveh, repented, God did not destroy them. Let's see what Jonah's attitude was like. And let's see what God's response to him was. Next slide. Yes. And this was in approximately 755 BC. Next slide. So this is after God does not destroy the people. In the meantime, it was very hot, and the Lord gave Jonah a vine to cover his head from the sun. Then he caused the vine to die. So Jonah is messed up about two things. One, God did not kill the Ninevites, the Assyrians. So they are a potential threat to his nation, so he's upset about that. And second, the vine that was covering him from the sun has died. So he's upset about two things. And he's being very honest with God. So he prayed. Next. Oh Lord, I knew from the very beginning that you wouldn't destroy Nineveh. That's why I left my own country and headed for Spain. Now, here is the heart of God that Jonah knew. You are kind, you're merciful, you're patient. You always show love. <laughs> this is in the Old Testament, folks. Under the time of law, this man of God knew the heart of God. You always show love. And you don't like to punish anyone. Do people in the world have that idea? That God doesn't like to punish anyone? No. No. When 9-11 happened, what was the first thing you heard? God is coming down in America. You have to be very careful. Because what does it say here? You don't like to punish anyone. Even foreigners. This is the heart of God. And Jonah knew that. That's why he didn't want to go to them. Kind, merciful, patient, loving. Does he punish? Did he punish? Yes. But is that God's heart to punish? Is he waiting with the hammer to bang people on the head? No. That is not his heart. But if people and in the nation of Israel continue to rebel and disobey, then punishment would come. But is that God's first choice? No. No. So this idea of a father that's there with a hammer, you just have all the line and I'm going to hit you. That is not true. His first choice and his last choice is mercy. But because of Israel's continuing disobedience, then punishment will come. But that's not what God wanted for them. Next slide. So now the Lord responds to Jonah. Next slide. You are concerned about a vine that you did not plant or take care of. A vine that grew up in one night and died the next. In that city of Nineveh, there are more than 120,000 people who cannot tell right from wrong. God cares about people. But that is not all God cares about. And many cattle are also there. You mean God cares about the animals in the city? Yes. Did you ever realize that? I remember a couple of years ago, there was a prophetic declaration that God was going to bring an earthquake to Southern California. And this person said, you better flee and leave Southern California. But this is what God says about Nineveh. We have millions of people here. Millions of, and probably millions of cats and dogs. <laughs> Amen? If God was concerned about 120,000 people and the animals, you think he doesn't care about LA? You think he doesn't care about your dog or your pet cat? That's the kind of God we have. 
That's one of the reasons he didn't want to punish a nation. Many people and many cattle, many animals. God doesn't even want to hurt your kitty cat. Amen? Does that change your idea of God a bit? That God even cares about what you care about? If you have a pet rat, he probably cares about it because you care about it. That's the God we serve. Amen? And hopefully your mind begin to, oh, he's not there with a hammer, he's there with an open hand. A hand that's been pierced by a nail. Amen? Yeah. Next slide. So this is the heart of Father God. Let's summarize it. Mercy, kindness, patience, forgiveness, and love. God is looking for relationships with his children. Relationships. He's not out to punish us. Does that mean he's soft on sin? No. No. God is not soft on sin. He punished sin in the body of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen? Jesus went to the cross and they said that his, he didn't even look human after he was beaten. His face and his body was so ripped up. The movie The Passion doesn't tell the worst of it. He suffered tremendously because God hates sin. And he hates what sin does to us. That's why he punished sin in the body of Jesus. Amen? God is not soft on sin. He is not. He hates sin. And that's why Jesus suffered so much. And that's why, as we trust in Jesus, we don't have to worry about punishment. Because Jesus has borne it. Amen? So that is the heart of Father God. Next slide. Jesus said about Jonah, the men of Nineveh will stand up in the judgment with this generation and condemn it. For they repented at the preaching of Jonah, and now someone greater than Jonah is here. That was Jesus commenting, looking back at Jonah. Next slide. Another reason why Jonah, the inside story, why Jonah didn't want to go to Nineveh. Jonah was a prophet. He knew the heart of God, and it's quite possible, I can't say this is definitively true, but it's quite possible that he knew what was going to happen 30 or more years down the road. It says in Amos, the Lord God does nothing without revealing his plan. Is that the next slide? To his servants, the prophet. Next slide, please. In the past, God had shown a prophet that a particular nation was going to punish Israel. Elisha, this is a, a man called Hazael from modern day Syria. He came to Elisha asking whether his king, the king of Syria, would recover from the disease. Elisha said, go and say to him, you will certainly recover. Nevertheless, the Lord has revealed to me that he will in fact die. Elisha stared at Hazael until Hazael was embarrassed. Then the man of God began to weep. Why is my Lord weeping? asked Hazael. Now Hazael is a Syrian captain who represents the king of Syria. Next slide coming to a prophet of God to find out about the future. Because I know the harm you will do to the Israelites, Elisha answered. You will set fire to their fortified places, kill the young men and women with the sword, dash their children to the ground, rip open their pregnant women. Hazael said, how could your servant, a mere dog, accomplish such a feat? Next slide. The Lord has shown me that you will become king of Aram, answered Elisha. So the Lord sometimes does show his prophets what will happen to his people if they refuse to repent. This was fulfilled, we don't have time to go there, in 2 Kings, where the Syrians came in and they slaughtered the Israelites. So I believe, I, don't, I can't prove it absolutely, but I suspect that Jonah knew that 40 years down the road, if his nation were disobedient to God, God would allow the Assyrians to come in and slaughter them. And that is exactly what happened. Jonah went to Nineveh about 755 BC, and around 722 BC, about 30 years later, 30 years or so later, the Assyrians, who had repented 30 years before, maybe a new king came around, their hearts changed, and they came and they slaughtered Jonah's people. That's one of the reasons why Jonah probably didn't want to go. But that was not God's heart. That was not God's heart. Next slide. The people of Israel were taken from their homeland into exile in Assyria. The capital of Assyria is Nineveh. Next slide. They're still there. 
The king of Assyria brought people from Babylon, Kutha, Abba, Hamath, and Seth by name, and settled them in the towns of Samaria to replace the Israelites. They took over Samaria, which is the capital of Israel, and lived in its towns. So what Jonah was afraid of actually happened. Jonah was probably dead by now. This was about 30 to 40 years after Jonah had gone to Nineveh. They repented then. But like 40 years down the road, a new king possibly, but their hearts turned again. And they came and they slaughtered the Israelites. Because the Israelites were guilty and would not repent. But that was not God's heart. So that's another reason. If you're wondering why did Jonah run away, I believe that's another reason why. He, believed, he knew this was going to happen. Next slide. So this is what happened. The northern kingdom of Israel was captured by the Assyrians and they brought in people from other countries. And that's one of the reasons why the Jews hated the Samaritans so much. The Samaritans were pagans, idol worshippers, brought in by the Assyrians to live in this area that used to be the capital of northern of Israel. You see that area called Galilee? The Sea of Galilee, this area here is known as Galilee of the Gentiles. It was dominated by the Gentiles brought in by the Assyrians. You know who was raised in Galilee? Our Lord Jesus Christ. Nazareth was his hometown. Then he later moved to Capernaum. And this is where most of the disciples came from, Galilee, which was dominated by the Gentiles after the capture of the northern part of Israel by the Assyrians. Next slide. The Assyrian nation, the Assyrian Empire, became very, very powerful. This is about a hundred years after Jonah. They continue to become very powerful. It covers what we call modern day, part of modern day Turkey, Syria, Iraq, and Iran, part of Iran. That's the Assyrian Empire. They dominated the entire area. So Jonah had a good reason to be concerned, but he should have trusted God. Yeah. And knowing that God's heart is always good for his people. Even though they took over the northern area, they didn't capture Jerusalem. Jerusalem was kept safe. But the northern part of Israel was captured by the Assyrians. So what does this have to do with God's heart and what does it have to do with Jesus? Let's keep going. Next slide. Keep going. Again. Leaving Nazareth, speaking of Jesus, he went and lived in Capernaum, which was by the lake in the area of Zebulun and Naphtali. Zebulun and Naphtali are in the northern area, close to the Sea of Galilee. To fulfill which was said through the prophet Isaiah, land of Zebulun and land of Naphtali, the way of the sea beyond the Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles. It's called Galilee of the Gentiles. That was the first area conquered by the Assyrians and dominated by the foreigners since that time. That's where Jesus was sent to. Now, the prophet Isaiah put that, was given that prophecy by the Lord to encourage Israel. You have been captured, you have been dominated, but I am going to send hope, I am going to send help. Do not give up. I have good plans for you. In the midst of all the suffering, God is saying, don't give up. I have good plans for you. Next slide. The people living in darkness have seen a great light. On those living in the land of the shadow of death, a light has dawned. Jesus fulfilled that prophecy. What did Jesus call himself? He said, I am the light of the world. Jesus lived physically in an area that was considered spiritually dark, but he was the light of the world. And his coming into the world brought light not just to the Jewish people, but to all people because he was the savior of the entire world. And it makes you wonder, why of all places did the Heavenly Father send Jesus to an area dominated by Gentiles, spiritually dark? Why not put him in Jerusalem, in the middle of all these religious Jews? Because God's heart is for all people. Amen? God's plan is much bigger than our national ideas. God has, from the very beginning, desired that all people, Jews and Gentiles, come to know him come to receive this love, come to receive the salvation available through Jesus. So God's plan was always much bigger than the servants understood. Next slide. So we see here, again, the area of Galilee, Capernaum, which is where Jesus moved to, but he grew up in Nazareth, then he moved to Capernaum, 
And this area is Gog of the Gentiles. Right down here is the area called Sychar. And in that area was where Jesus met the Samaritan woman at the well. Remember he came light in the darkness. The Samaritans were very spiritually dark. He was sent primarily to the Jews and later on the disciples went to the world. But he visited that woman in John 4 as a reminder that he's the savior of not just the Jews but of the entire world. Next slide. This is the area where Jesus met the Samaritan woman. It's between two mountains, Mount Ebal and Mount Gerizim. Mount Gerizim was a mount of blessing. When the Israelites came out from Egypt, some tribes stood on Mount Gerizim and they made pronounced the blessings. Some tribes stood on Mount Ebal and pronounced curses. And in this area, in this area around here, there's Jacob's well. That's where Jesus met the Samaritan woman. Remember, he is a light to the Gentiles as well as to the Jews. He came in the area of darkness. And let's read a bit about that. Next slide. Woman, Jesus said, believe me, a time is coming when you will worship the Father, neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. A time is coming and has now come when true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth, for they are the kind of worshipers the Father seeks. God is spirit, and his worshipers must worship him in spirit and in truth. Why did Jesus say that? You see, the Samaritans, you may not have known this, thought they had learned something of the true God, but it mixed it in with some pagan religion. And they believed that God had to be worshipped on Mount Gerizim. The Jews built the temple of God that God commanded in Jerusalem. The Samaritans built their own temple in Mount Gerizim. So the lady, that's why she's asking Jesus about where you should worship. And Jesus said, that's irrelevant. What the Father, uh, Father God wants is for people to worship Him in spirit and in truth. He wants relationship. He doesn't care about locality. So Jesus is beginning to show light into this woman's life. And as a result of that, next slide, he explains to her that he is the Messiah. The woman said, I know that Messiah is coming, and when he comes, he will explain everything to us. Then Jesus declared, I, the one speaking to you, I am he. This is one probably the only time when Jesus clearly stated that I am the Messiah. It was to a Gentile woman, a Samaritan, descendant from the people who had decimated the Jewish people many years ago. Jesus was the light sent in the middle of the spiritual darkness to let people know the Father loves you, and I am here as your savior. It's interesting. He didn't tell the Jewish people so plainly. At the time when he made allusion to it, they wanted to stone him. But he told this man and woman plain, plainly, I am he, I am the Messiah. She was, she became a believer and she became actually a very powerful evangelist. She went to the town and then the whole town came out to hear him. And because of their desire, he stayed there several days teaching them. This is the heart of God. Not just one tribe, not just one people, but all tribes, all people through Jesus are brought into the love of the Father. That was his plan, that was his desire from the very beginning. And when the Jewish prophets didn't really understand, they saw it very dimly, Jesus came to bring the final revelation. It says in Hebrews, God the Father spoke in the last days by his prophets, but in these last days he has spoken by his Son. The Son said, if you see me, you see the Father. He brought the final revelation of the Father's love to us. And when he went to the cross, that was of course the extremely powerful demonstration of the love of God. Because he took upon himself all of our sicknesses, all of our diseases, that's why he was beaten. His blood was shed so that we could be forgiven. The Trinity is not divided. The love of the Father, the heart of the Father, the heart of Jesus, the heart of the Spirit, is the same heart, is the same love, for humanity. Not a heart that seeks to punish. Punishment comes if people totally reject God's way. We bring ourselves into problems. And even there, if we cry out to God and say, help me, he comes in right away. His heart is to save. Jesus has already taken the punishment upon himself. And if we trust in Jesus, we enter into all that God has for us. He has planned for every human being alive, a wonderful life, written up in heaven, Psalm 139 verse 16 that we alluded to. He wants that for every man, every woman, and every child on earth. He loves us with a love that we cannot even comprehend. What little we understand, it blows our mind away. That's the love of God. 
remember we were speaking about uh, Isaiah, about Isaiah chapter 9, verse 1 and 2. How about the darkness, the people living in darkness have seen a great light. Let's go there. Oh, Mount Gerizim, this is the place where the Samaritans built a temple to God. The Jews destroyed it. The Jews destroyed it because God's real temple was in Jerusalem. And the Jews were afraid if people go to this temple, they will have a mixture of religion. They will not worship the true God. So this was built around 400 BC. The Jews destroyed it around 200 BC. The ruins are still there today. And you can go visit them. So that's where the Samaritan lady was talking about. Should we worship God here or somewhere else? And Jesus said, the Father wants worshipers who worship Him in spirit and in truth. Location is irrelevant. Next slide. Remember the scripture? For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. This is in the same chapter where it's mentioned that those that dwell in darkness have seen a great light. In other words, when Jonah went and prophesied to the Assyrians and they repented, but the Israelites themselves remained disobedient, punishment came. But Isaiah was led by the Holy Spirit at, at the Father's request to put this prophecy Telling the Jewish people, yes, you are going through darkness right now, but I am going to send help. I am going to send hope. Those who have been crushed and been dominated by foreign nations, there is hope. And expand that to today. The devil caused a lot of suffering, but Jesus came and he took all the sins of the world on himself. We are now free from, from the domination of the devil. We live in freedom, but there are people in the world who don't yet know that. At this Christmas time, this song is very popular, but let's think about what it truly means. Can you hear it? Yeah. Unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful. Counselor, the mighty God, the everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. This is the heart of God. God is not looking to punish people. He's looking for them to receive Jesus as Savior, to receive Jesus as Lord, to enter into all he has for them. And the heart of the Father is the same as the heart of Jesus. A heart of love, a heart of tremendous compassion, a heart of mercy, that's why Jesus had to suffer so much. At Christmas time, we, we uh, sing a lot of songs, and it's good to look at the background of these songs. So hopefully, as you hear this song in the future, you remember that it was spoken to a nation that had been crushed, that had been dominated by the Assyrians. And even in that time of suffering, the Father is saying, I have good plans for you. You're in a valley of, in a shadow of darkness, but I'm going to send a great light. That great light was the Lord Jesus Christ. And that great light came not just to Israel, it came to the entire world. That is a heart of Father, a heart of love, a heart of redemption, a heart of mercy. And at this Christmas time, share this message with people that God is not to bash them. He already bashed Jesus on the cross. And as they trust in Jesus and receive what Jesus has already done for them, they too can enter into all that God has for them. It's already there, but they must believe and they must receive in order to walk in it. Amen?